I'm Jim Carlson and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's theme Thursday, season three, recorded on November 9th, 2017. Theme Thursday is a Gallup webcast series that dives deep into the Clifton Strengths theme, one theme at a time, and today's is strategic. If you have questions, comments, or contributions during this live webcast, we do have a live chat room that's available for you right below the main video window. Oh, 14 or 15 of you signed up out there and about 25 watching, so there's 10 of you have not signed into the, log, into the chat room yet. Bottom left-hand corner, it says log in. It's right below the video window if you just, just go down there. Log in, bottom left-hand corner, choose the guest account. Take, your, take the guest name out, and there's some numbers. Take those out, put your name in, hit submit, and that'll get you right in. You can also log in with any of the 15 social media accounts, maybe Facebook, Google+, LinkedIn, Twitter, any of those. You can log in with those accounts as well. Easy way to get in. Don't create a new account. We'd love to have your questions or comments during the program. It's a great way for us to chat with you while we are live. If you're listening to the recorded version or have questions about uh, custom strengths coaching solutions for small, medium, or large organizations, you can send us an email, uh, contact us, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to visit the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com for all your Clifton Strengths coaching resources and training needs. You can also catch the video in both streaming and downloadable audio. We call that podcasting. That's kind of a new thing. A lot of people are catching on to it. It actually has apps now, native apps for both Android and iPhone are available for you. You can uh, get the links to those. Easy, just one button push to get subscribed to our podcast, a great way to make sure you're always having the most recent information. Although we do love it when you join us live. That's the most fun when you come out here and join us live. So for all those folks that are in the chat room, thanks for coming out. But those links to get it all done, coaching.gallup.com. Mike Labyrinth's our host today. She works as a workplace consultant and she's been a little um, on my beard going on here. I've even been called homeless. Micah, welcome to Theme Thursday. I don't think I called you homeless. I had a wonderful strategic way of asking if you had been left in the studio for uh, several weeks. Well, I don't know how long the beard's going to last. It's no shave November. Nobody cares if they're listening to this in April that uh, these kinds of things are happening. But I've been getting a lot of feedback on it. I don't know. I don't know how long it'll last. But I do know what will last, and that's this webcast that we do and all this information on strategic today. Uh, if you haven't downloaded the companion guide yet, go ahead and go out there and get that downloaded. Lots of great information. Micah's got some great stuff for you. Micah, when we think about strategic, what do we think about? Great. So you know what? I think we think about a lot of things. Strategic, I would say, is one of those themes that when it shows up, no matter where it is on somebody's profile, it um, it your eye gets attracted to the, attracted to the word. And it's important to realize that with Clifton Strengths, we do have a very specific definition of strategic. Let's take a look at that companion guide, and we'll talk just a little bit about starting with that that long definition at the very beginning. When we think about strategic, it is about sorting through clutter, noticing patterns, and being able to sort very quickly to the best route forward. It's not a skill that can be taught. So if you've ever been told you need to be more strategic, probably a good way to to, to press back and say, okay, what really do you mean by that? Uh, when we talk about strategic, we think about a very distinct way of thinking. People with high strategic tend to notice patterns, play out alternatives, and then continue to ask, what if, if then? I think about strategic sometimes, and Carol Ann McGuire this week posted a really great picture of strategic that had a whole bunch of arrows. It looked almost like a flow chart. And I think about strategic often as that way, being able to play out scenarios, not just what's the next step, but what will be the residual effect? What will be the step after that and after that? And then what will we do? So if you're someone with high strategic, you discard those paths that lead to nowhere. You really do look for uh, relevance or, or perhaps even efficiency. It's also a lot about culling and making selections until you arrive at the best strategy or the best path forward. Um, so a lot of uh, the definition of strategic is understanding it's not just thinking carefully. I think sometimes we use that word to mean thoughtful um, or, or even critical. When we think strategic as a Clifton Strengths theme, I want you to think about somebody who asks, who, who thinks about options, who sorts through options, usually quicker than others, who asks what if and if then. It is the, the last one of our strategic thinking themes in the strategic thinking domain. Um, and in fact, I think we only have one theme left in season three. Uh, so a, a fantastic way to really wrap up those strategic thinking themes. I think about three words with strategic. I think about let's zoom out. 
So if you are an individual, that probably means that you're thinking sort of one level up. If you're a leader, that same sort of understanding applies. You're just going to go one further level up as a leader. Um, spotting patterns, considering options, you're determining multiple ways to proceed. So you might all you might at any time have five or six different ways that you could go and then very quickly be able to sort to where are we going. That kind of quickness can be dizzying for people who aren't following your train of thought. And strategic as very distinct way of thinking isn't a linear train of thought. It is um, more about, again, seeing the 40,000 foot view all at once and being able to understand how things are linked and how things get us to where we're going. So that it can be kind of dizzying for people who aren't thinking with the same kind of speed. And it might be worth in, in some cases displaying your thoughtfulness, even if you can't track it yourself. And I'd, I'd say that because very often people with high strategic find it difficult to describe that theme because the sorting that sounds careful, it sounds cautious, it sounds almost methodical, when it's within the theme of strategic, it's happening naturally and it's happening at such a speed that it's almost invisible even to the person thinking through it. So it might be important to help people understand that this is what your brain is doing at all times because I think that's going to help establish a, a real strong foundation of trust. Consider different ways that you might get these points across, that you might help somebody understand, I've considered several options. Um, this will help us to complete XYZ. You tend to probably work backwards. Again, not just point A to point B to point C. Um, use this to your advantage by talking about really what is the end goal. It will help all of the pieces fall into place for other people. Also think about Perhaps sometimes what's dizzying to folks is if they catch you in the middle of that sorting and culling process um, and before you've come to your, to your conclusion or to the next best pathway forward. I think it's important to sort to people who can be there with you, um, who can who can be really great thought partners, people who can follow the breadcrumbs, but also differentiate between when are you in possibility mode and when are you in decision mode. So think uh, perhaps about the relationships that you have and as well as the other themes that you have that your strategic acts as an accelerant to. I would look for some great thought partners thinking about who can sharpen your thinking edge? Do you need more evidence, more emotional awareness, more help with messaging, or more somebody who can help you really align your thinking to where the industry is going or where the organization is going? People with high strategic can fall into the trap of, I put it this way, carrying the cerebral load which sounds like you should put it um, on your resume. I carry a great cerebral load. But really what I mean is because you're constantly doing the thinking about what if, you can, in many cases, jump in and do all the thinking for everybody. Uh, sometimes it can be easier just to make the plan yourself than to help other people um, sort of take on any of that, than to delegate it, or even than to tell people how they fit into that plan. It's easier just to keep it in your head sometimes. So it's important for leaders with high strategic to think about how, when, and who do I delegate planning or, or coming up with options um, to. Or, or how do I delegate, take what I've been delegated and share that with other people? That can be a really great leadership muscle to flex, that of empowering people rather than doing all the thinking yourself. So sort out how to think collaboratively as well as how to outline expectations and allow other people to get there maybe in a plan that you that you didn't uh, think about or that you didn't create. So again, I think the the challenge of being a great manager or a great leader with with high strategic is not just mapping all of the all of the plans on your own, but using to your advantage the fact that you think a little bit backwards. Um, and by that, I mean, you start at the end goal and then work your way toward where you are today. Um, use that to really emphasize what does success look like? What does clarity look like? Get people on board around why that's where we're going. And then test out ways that you can sort of step off of that page of planning and, and empower others to, to be in charge on, on pieces of it. The last thing I like to talk about are those four needs of followers. And then I've got a great strategic leader I, I can't wait to introduce you to. A leader with strategic might build trust by knowing the details of past successes that you've planned. Just like it can be difficult for someone with high strategic to understand their thought process while they're in the middle of it, 
it can be often not a place that you focus um, if you look backwards. Now, our guest leader today, her favorite theme other than strategic is context. So I imagine this looks a little bit different for her. But strategic by itself isn't necessarily about the future or the past. It's about the plan. It's about the the possibilities and, and sort of playing out the alternatives. So think about building trust by really studying times when your plan has worked. Be able to be armed with that and make a note of the patterns. Um, you, might, you might even help people see the patterns that you're spotting because depending on your other themes, those patterns could be really a proof or data-driven. They could be emotional. They could be about a theme or an idea. Um, if you can help other people see some of those patterns out loud, I think that's letting others into the great talent that you have around your strategic. So um, if you are in, in a meeting and you're noticing some patterns, you might just say, hey, is anyone else seeing this? Or, or how does this tie back to where we were before? Um, a great sort of out loud way to get your strategic into a place where other people can trust it, but where other people can also benefit from it. Help other people make some of those, uh, those pattern connections. A leader might use strategic to build stability um, this way. So when you're, total, when you're unsure, test out your plans with a neutral thought partner. Um, know when you should be playing the what if game out loud and when it's going to be dizzying for others. Um, I think that strategic has a little bit of the ability to say, I'll figure it out because strategic by itself is about having as many alternatives as possible and, and really never getting stuck into a corner that you can't get out of. Um, but pay attention to the times when your plans feel more stop, more solid and when you feel like you might have to go to plan D, E, F, or G. Um, and in those moments, again, find a thought partner who's going to maybe not hang on your every word. Uh, the, the difficulty of thinking about strengths um, in leadership is that very often that safe space that you need in order to craft a plan in order to bounce ideas off of each other um, is hard to come by because people want to, to take everything you, you say as being uh, verbatim and as being important as being part of the direction that they want to follow. So to provide stability, make sure you've got some safe space you can play things out um, and understand where that safe space is. A leader might use strategic to show compassion by turning your curiosity into the plots and patterns of your people. So spot recurring talents. Look for, um, your, again, your gift is in, is in noticing patterns. So think about what am I seeing that makes time disappear for people over and over again? What, where am I seeing opportunities that people are asking me for the same thing many different ways? You might spot those patterns or those opportunities for development before your people even do. So again, think about that nature of pattern spotting and of sort of figuring out the puzzle as being something that you can apply toward your people. It almost sounds like I'm describing strategic as a relationship building skill, and I think in many ways it can be. Finally, a leader can use strategic to inspire hope because the nature of strategic is anticipatory. Um, it's about thinking about what is going to happen, what's coming that hasn't yet been here, what could be the best result of today's actions. It is almost the opposite of saying, here's the why, and then we're going to work backwards. Strategic and hope really connect when we say, when we do this, it will lead to a better tomorrow. It will lead to something else that we haven't imagined yet. It will lead to something that's an improvement over where our current state is. You can make that connection for other people. And if you can find great ways to communicate it or individualize what, uh, what the ways to communicate it in the way that, uh, that resonates most with individual people, again, a wonderful use of that talent and a great, great muscle to sort of flex and think about growing it into a strength. I hope that helps you dive into strategic from a leadership standpoint, really isolate it from hopefully some other themes and, and understand it. You're probably going to see strategic quite a bit. It is fifth in our database worldwide, so it shows up um, pretty often uh, in, in folks. In, it is going to show up very differently depending on what the um, what the themes are that surround it. Uh, in our pre-call, uh, I, I was speaking with our guest and both of us have high strategic and both of us had struggled to really understand what is the essence of strategic by itself because it plays so quickly, so naturally, um, so malleably, if that's a word, it's not, uh, with other themes. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of um, understanding just of the strategic theme on its own.
At this point, I want to introduce you to somebody that I first met when I was actually leading um, a session with the organization that she works with. And I've gotten to work with this leader um, very often and see the fantastic um, talent that she brings not only to her organization, but to the strengths community in general. It's Tess Starman. Tess, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. Hey, Tess, could you tell us just a little bit about yourself and, and what it is you do? Sure. Um, so I work for the organization Teammates Mentoring Program. And if you've been around um, Strengths a little while, we've done a couple recent webcasts with Called to Coach. Uh, and so you can learn all about it there. Uh, but we're a one-to-one -one school based mentoring program. And I'm based out of Omaha, but we're all across Nebraska, parts of Iowa, and, um, South Dakota, Kansas, and Wyoming. And so we're um, a pretty large organization. And within that organization, I'm the research specialist. So I oversee uh, data collection, um, survey research, um, measurements of outcomes and statistics and so a lot of things with numbers uh, that might bore a lot of people but I enjoy it. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. Might bore a lot of people. I don't think it ever bores you. And anytime I've ever heard you talk about research, it does not bore me. So there's something about you that is in the right place. Um, Tess, your top five are context, adaptability, strategic learner, and individualization. When we've been thinking purely about strategic, how has that theme affected your leadership in this role? Sure. I think uh, for me, strategic, I mean, as you mentioned, is all about pathways and patterns and looking at kind of the what if. And with this role specifically, it's uh, somewhat new. We've shifted a little bit within our organization. And so I have a slightly different emphasis and it's been a lot more open-ended in terms of what research could we do? What should we be focusing on? Uh, where are going to be our best opportunities to show the impact of our organization? And so purely in dreaming about what kind of this new role and shift within the organization is, that's where a lot of this strategic has played out. In terms terms of what do we really want to focus on, what's going to be the most beneficial in terms of communicating and showing the world the impact that teammates does have on the lives of the youth that we serve. Wow, so you're really tying together a bunch of research, but also just a, a, a healthy dose of mission, it sounds like as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> when you think about strategic, what is it that makes it stand on its own? Like, how do you even describe what st strategic really is, Tess? <laughs> It's a really good question. <laughs> uh, for me, I think I, I talk about it a lot in patterns and the way that I would describe it really succinctly would be uh, able to make order out of chaos. And uh, I can I can easily look at something that might confuse someone like, I mean, a, the 300 page document of um, of strengths uh, and the research behind strengths. Or um, I can look at pretty heavy research documents. I can look at a large spreadsheet of numbers and easily pinpoint patterns, easily see what uh, the underlying current is behind anything that's going on. And so I think there's this ability to draw out what's really important and what we see that's reoccurring within any sort sort of conglomeration of, of data or numbers or anything like that. Excellent. So what do you think strategic really provides to the people who rely on you or, or the people who you lead? Um, I think it provides um, trust, stability, compassion, and hope um, <laughs> through those, those, those four needs. Um, no, I think really, um, uh, I actually, in, in processing and preparing for this day, I kind of talked to a few of my coworkers and um, about really what, how they viewed strategic because I was having such a hard time describing it myself. So I asked them and, and they used the word thoughtful and they said, you can always uh, tell when you're really focused and intent on the process, on whatever you're doing, uh, because you are, you're kind of in the zone, you're working and you always bring up uh, questions that are valid, that we need to be thinking about, that others might not think about. And I think that that's a, one of the important parts of strategic is with that 40,000 foot view, uh, I'm able to see, and I, people with strategic are able to see all of the factors that are playing into any given situation. And I think that's very important because not a lot of people can see that because oftentimes other strengths um, and other blends are so ingrained in the moment, in the decision, in the process, that it's hard to zoom out and see what else is affecting what's going on. And I think that's really beneficial to followers to be able to say, well, have we considered this? Or what about this factor that we haven't really thought about? Tess, is that something that you have to uh, turn on? Or is it constantly just how you're seeing the world? I mean, it, it almost sounds exhausting to be able to have that 40,000 foot view at all times. Yes, definitely. It is. And uh, it's, it's, 
an ingrained thought process. And I think that's why it's so hard to describe strategic is, and because, and, and I have a lot of strategic thinking themes when you zoom out to my top 10. And, and so when people ask me about them, I'm like, I always say it's hard with any theme really to divorce yourself from yourself. Like mm-hmm. I can't get out of myself to really describe how someone else thinks because this is just how I think. And, and so it's, it's nice to have language around it and to have this theme, uh, but it's so ingrained in, in how I do anything. And it can be exhausting. I actually had someone say the other day I was um, traveling recently. Um, I was in Greece, got to work with refugees there. And, um, and we took a day trip to the city of Corinth and it was with my church. And so we were learning about kind of what Paul um, said to the Corinthians, wrote the letters there. And I was asking all these questions and our kind of tour guide, the guy that was leading us around was asking us what we knew about Paul and the Bible and these letters. And I kept spouting off things. And, um, and one of the people that I was with said, it must be exhausting to be you, to be inside your brain. <laughs> and like out loud, she said this. And I was like, I guess, but also not because it's, I mean, with talent, and we talk about this all the time, when you're functioning in your strengths, when you're using your talents, it's what gives you energy and what gives you life. And so people might look at me and they're like, oh, your brain is like on overdrive all the time. And and I don't feel like that. I mean, I definitely know and know myself well enough that I, I'm an introvert and I need time to, to write and to process and to think things through. Um, but that's just my brain. It's how it works and it gives me energy. And I love thinking and, and thinking about processes and all the factors that go into, into any given situation. That's probably something you mentioned really accurately there, a clue to talent. You know, you get energy from it. It's not exhausting. It's, it's the opposite of exhausting, being able to think, wow, I'm standing here in this place. I've got high context, so I know the details of what this place really means. And I now have 75 questions I want to ask you about because I can see what else it's connected to. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Gosh, that's wonderful. Um, When you think more specifically about stability or or trust or hope or compassion, is there any one of those that you feel is more tied to your strategic? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I feel like Um, All of them definitely are very much tied to it, but I think there's something about um, stability, especially with strategic Um, and the way that I I know quite a few people with strategic, as you mentioned, it's a very common theme uh, within the Gallup database. And um, when I describe it to people, um, I describe it a lot as just this gut. You kind of have this gut instinct about what decision needs to be made and what factors you need to take into account. And so I think for me, there are very few times, and I asked a leader I was coaching um, a few weeks ago, um, if there are any times where your gut has been wrong. And um, that might seem um, maybe arrogant to some people or prideful, but I think there's something about strategic that innately knows what the best what the best decision is that needs to be done. And, and sometimes there are points where for the sake of a team or a relationship where you have to yield that and say, I know that this is the best decision, but you all want to go in this direction. So let's let's move in that direction. But there's something about strategic that innately knows what the best decision is. And there's that gut response. And I think because when you are in an organization or you're with the team for a while, um, other people start to see that, that the decisions and the ideas that you have about what needs to be done continue to prove valid and reliable. And so over time, there is a stability and a trust, or definitely a stability that comes into play because it's almost like a proven track record that people see the decisions that you make and they see them as valid and reliable. So they continue continue to um, find the steadiness of your decision making as logical as sound because you are taking into account um, all of these different factors. Have you ever had to prove that over time? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. And I think that that goes into trust. I think with with a leader and, and their followers that another one of those four needs um, because I think that that you can be as confident and assured in your choice. But if other people aren't on board, uh, it's not really going to matter if it's a team effort. And so uh, you need to, I think, any leader, and it's definitely, I think, strategic sometimes. It gets me in trouble a lot. I don't know about other people because I know what I what I think really needs to be done, and I'm very assured in that, but I haven't communicated it well to the people around me or I haven't welcomed them into the process of making the decision. And so um, proving over time, really, it takes trust. It takes um it takes a reliability within your team to to kind of create that history saying, yes, I um, over time, 
once again, here's another sound decision. Here's another sound decision. It takes, um, it's a process. And, and one of my favorite quotes is relationships move at the speed of trust. And that's different for different people. And so um, it, it takes a lot of time in speaking as a millennial, I'll say it, um, who hasn't been with organizations for a long time. It's, I know that even if I have a positional authority, that I still need to gain the relational authority, that I still need to, to build trust. And that takes time and it takes proving yourself kind of over and over again with sound decisions. I want to dive into that a little bit more. What you mentioned about, gosh, trusting your gut, that could sound like a lot of themes. You know, it could sound mm -hmm. like self-assurance. It could almost even sound like connectedness. But I think what's unique and accurate about strategic is the reason you can trust your gut. So maybe part of the development is not just building trust with others, but building why are you trusting yourself? Um, mm -hmm. So take us back to when, when Tess mentioned it must be exhausting to be in your head. It's not because her... It's not because she's in her gut, you know, it's in her head. And so what she's constantly thinking about is that 40,000 foot view. Probably the reason that people with high strategic tend to feel like their decisions are sound over and over and over again is because they are never shutting off the analysis that's happening sort of in the background. I'm imagining a whole bunch of old giant computers the size of rooms that are just constantly going through everything that they're taking in, looking and scanning and, and looking and sorting for patterns. So I think it's important to help people understand that this isn't just about a gut reaction. It is it is a strategic thinking theme, meaning it's something that happens in your brain. And because you're constantly taking in those patterns and sorting through them, that's probably why you're, on the whole, accurate more times than you're wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's it's legit. <laughs> Congrats, Tess. Thanks Thank for you. that. I also love that that piece around relationships move at the speed of trust. So an awareness of I can't just walk into the room and say, here's the right plan. I know this because my Clifton strengths say I have strategic number one. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Tess, when when do you do your best strategic thinking? Do you have times where you're a, a stronger thinker than others? Hmm. I think definitely. And I um, have been thinking a lot about <laughs> how I think and how I best think. And I had to laugh the other day. I was talking with my mom and I was just mentioning that I was kind of mulling over. She's taken strengths and I've shared with her a lot of this um, this process and was sharing with her that I was going to be um, talking about strategic this week. And she mentioned um, that I used to shut myself and lock myself in my bedroom when I was a kid. Um, to think and um, that I needed to have that space and that time alone to process and to think and I would you know not make it out for dinner not interact with anyone just like literally lock myself in my bedroom and I had no recollection of this I probably blocked it out of my memory but um, and I don't know if she's 100% truthful but um, but she <laughs> uh, but I think there's something about strategic and I think specifically within me as well, because I have a lot of other strategic thinking themes that I know that I need the time to process and I process in a few different ways. Um, and I think it depends on what it is. I'm definitely a written processor. I love to write. Um, I journal almost every day to process through what's going on. I also love to verbally process as well with other people, especially if it's about a people situation, a relational situation. But I think my best thinking comes out um, when I have processed through kind of all of the muck that's going on. So um, with relationships, if I, with emotions, if anything's going on, it kind of clouds my kind of rational judgment sometimes. And I think it does for a lot of people. I mean, you look at emotional intelligence research and everything is filtered through our emotions before it goes to our, the logical side of our brain. And so um, for me, I have to get out on paper or in person process through um, what is going on around me in order to kind of clear up my head space in order to really think critically and logically about any situation that's going on. Um, when it asks the question, does strategic keep you awake at night? Hmm. Thinking in particular, huh, how, how, how do you process that? Cause I know just strategic's 12 for me and I don't, I don't ever see that. I have actually, until we started looking at it, I, I never call on strategic for anything I'm doing. Maybe I should mm. think about that more, but I often go to bed thinking about problems and I, it's actually soothing and comforting for me. And maybe that's a little bit strategic coming out in me. What do you, Tess, how does that, how do you process that? 
Sure. Um, I guess I haven't actually heard that in regards to strategic. I often describe that when I talk with people that have high intellection. Um, and intellection is eight for me. It's in my top 10. And so I often am woken up at night, not necessarily thinking about the patterns um, and maybe the options like I would with strategic. But if I just haven't fully processed something or a given situation, um, I think it could be a blend of a few strengths. I think strategic can definitely keep people up at night, especially if um, you're coming into conflict with other people. People, um, because of your strategic, where you have an idea of what could be, um, you have an idea of the path that needs to be taken, but someone else isn't on board, um, or the team isn't on board, or you're not getting the okay to take that path. Um, I think that could definitely keep people up at night. Interesting. So some approval in there, right? When you mm -hmm. think about, you you know, you want to move in this direction, but maybe the organization. Can you talk a little bit about how you use strategic in your role now, especially with teammates, and where does that play in, and, and how do you maximize that? Sorry to use that theme, but you know, in a, in a, in a context, how, how are you using that at teammates? How does that work best for you? Sure. Uh, I think for me within my role, so I am um, part of kind of the administrative and support side of the organization, um, not directly with the program side, which is actually working with matches and working with um, the, the mentoring side. And so, but I have to work very closely in tandem with that side as well. And so for me, uh, my strategic comes out a lot actually in just how I handle my time and how I make decisions as to what is most important to tackle. Um, because I think with research, um, it's, and, and especially with our organization, we've been collecting data since its inception 25 years ago. And so there are so many questions that I am asking all the time and people are asking of me that it just isn't reasonable to be running those kind of analytics and those kind of statistics on a regular basis. And so for me, my strategic comes out in deciding what is most important to be analyzing on a regular basis and to be looking at and measuring on a regular basis in terms of how it relates to um, our mission, how it relates to the impact that we're having on youth. So really, uh, it functions a lot in terms of just sorting. So I take all of what we've done and all the options, which is a lot of what we've talked about, and I'm able to kind of call it down to what are the most important research questions that I need to be addressing right now to bring us to the next level as an organization. That ties nicely into Julia's question in the chat room. She says, what happens when you feel like you have too much to analyze? And how do you how do you handle that? What happens when you get over oh kind of get overwhelmed or overrun? Yeah, I think that that can happen very easily um, for people with strategic if you just isolate that theme in and of itself because you see all of the options and I'm looking at all of the options of the questions we can be asking uh, within our research and so I think it takes that person knowing themselves um, knowing when you need to pull back and I have awesome partners I have a great um, supervisor and great coworkers that are able to help me because I am just looking at research. I'm not, you know, working with communities, working with matches directly. And so they're able to give me input as to what is most important for them in order to turn around and share with donors and share with school districts. And so I think to help sort through options, I'm not working independently. And I, I know very few people that work totally independently. We're always relying on, I mean, our constituents or the people that we serve or our coworkers. And I think those people help give me voice, um, help give voice into what is the most important question to be asking at the moment. It helps kind of sift through all of those options, at least within um, my job, that's kind of the situation. Yeah. So in terms of leadership, who who are your followers? Who who are those people in, in your current role that you would say, yeah, these are the people that I'm 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 leading? Sure. Um, so I don't lead directly anyone, um, but I, um, as a byproduct, uh, especially within my previous role that I just transitioned out of, um, I was looking kind of at administering the database. And we, we work with about 150 different school districts or different communities around kind of the four states that we, five states we serve. And so I was working directly with a lot of community members in terms of um, helping to support them to turn in the best, um, highest quality data. And those are the people that I'm still really primarily serving and primarily working with. And um, a lot of, I think, um, the leadership that um, in my role comes as a byproduct of the work that I produce. And so um, I am looking and evaluating if we're asking the best questions that we are. Um, and from there, able to really um, serve those people well, but also help lead um, the organization in the right direction in terms of what questions we are to answer. 
Yeah. So in the sense of, of, of bringing stability to that group, because it sounds like it's mm-hmm. really important in your leadership role with that group to bring stability. How? Give me an example. How do you think strategic fits in for you? What kind of things do you do to give that group stability? Sure. I think um, for for us specifically, um, I think the biggest thing is consistency. And I think that leads to stability when we um, communicate consistently, when we produce consistent results. And so um, our organization, like I mentioned, has been data driven for a long time. And so I um, am constantly evaluating not only how we can make it better, but I don't want to scrap what we've done in the past. And that's definitely part of my context, I think, coming in there as well. Um, And I think by creating consistent results, so we're measuring pretty much the same thing every single year. We might tweak things a little bit to make it better, but not totally throwing out the bucket on what's been done, even though I have may have strong opinions that we should do things a little differently than it's been done before, or I may think that the research field is moving in the direction of this kind of analysis versus what we've done. Um, being okay with um, keeping things a little different than what I would prefer in order to keep things consistent. And I think with consistent messaging, we produce consistent dashboards and metric indicators every single year, people know what they're going to get. People expect certain things from from me and my role, from us as kind of the central office. So each community member um, gets the the consistent messaging and consistent metrics every single year. And I think that produces that stability. They can rely heavily um, on us in terms of what they're going to receive. Strategic can also have some uh, some ability to kind of speak ahead of itself. In other words, I know these things to be true. I've thought through these things. Do you ever run into, in your role, and as young as you are, and you, and you, your coworkers, your teammates, maybe a little older, do you ever run into that buzzsaw of, like, how, how can you know this? Like, you haven't been through it. How do you respond to those kinds of situations when you might be speaking this and someone's like, mm, Tess, maybe in a few years, you know? Yeah, I feel like um, I run into that a lot. And like I mentioned earlier, that strategic, I think, with anyone, regardless of your age, can can get you into trouble because you're always a few steps ahead of everyone else. And so if what I've learned, um, and I have a lot of learning still left to go, um, being the age that I am, um, I've learned that the best way is to communicate and be as open about my thought process and why I think we should do what we do. Um, why my idea I think is the most valid or why this option is the best option. And I think being open um, and honest and communicative about that um, helps people get on board. Obviously, there's always people that think that a different option is better. That isn't what I think. And so I think I have learned that um, just because of where I'm at in life, I've learned to yield to that and to say and, and to extend grace and to say, in my mind, okay, we're probably going to, you know, fall into a pitfall um, here shortly or a, a ditch in the road. But knowing that um, it's okay and it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to choose something that's not going to be the best for our organization if it if it results in learning. And most mistakes I've learned that w- there's always something you can learn and you can take away from that. So I think there's a healthy balance. And I think a lot of it goes into where you're at relationally with that person. So if I've built trust with that coworker, um, I could have a conversation and I might feel co- um, comfortable pulling them aside after and saying, hey, um, I wasn't super comfortable with the decision that we're making or didn't like how you approached that. Um, but I think it definitely comes and I have high individualization. So I'm like, like it's a case by case basis. I can't answer that question, Jim, but um, I think it definitely comes with with learning and growing and being confident and assured in your decisions, but also having the the temperament to know when to pause, when to step back and yield yield the turf to somebody else. Yeah, and that last sentence you said, um, one of the phrases that I've been thinking a lot about is, "It's not my turn." And mm-hmm. you know, sometimes just because we have the answers or just because we know things. If we're not in the if we're not in the right spot in leadership to have an impact, it can actually be detrimental to the team if we don't come along with the leadership, even though we might know differently. And people get really frustrated because they know, especially high strategic. I think it's really frustrated because it's like I know, like I've thought through this, and sometimes it's not our turn, right? I think sometimes we have to kind of say, you know, I'm not in all of the areas of influence that I that I need to be in to be able to to make this change. Doesn't mean we shouldn't say anything about it. It just means it's not our turn. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I think adds a little context. Micah, we brought you back. How, how are you? Was everything all right I'm over good. there? Everything good. was awful, but it's all okay. I had like 12 <laughs> backup plans. <laughs> nice. Well, your, you know your strategic think, kicked in and you got, you got back on. That's right. You know what? I think 
Tess, you, you, there's a lot of grace in what you said of knowing that you've got a lot to learn. I don't think that's an age thing. I think we've all got a lot to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I am sort of thinking about that piece around it's not my turn. It, still with strategic, it becomes part of the pattern. It becomes part of what you're noticing. And and you can use that. Um, I don't think that's just your learner speaking there. I mean, your learner says, wow, that's a learning opportunity. But I think strategic also says, well, this might not be the whole picture yet. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, how do I jump out from some of those patterns, some of that feedback, some of that, um, hey, we're going down a direction that I don't think is right. Um, Strategic probably can pivot really quickly and just be Mm -hmm. able to um, see the connection between what's going on in that moment and what that is going to build to that we're, we're just not where we are. So it's not even so much, it's not my turn. It's that this is only one chapter right now. There's, there's probably something bigger, some 40,000 foot view that we're not seeing. Yeah. Good. Micah, don't you think though, in, in those contexts, when we think about bringing, you know, this compassion and hope as a leader into these roles of being able to express that in dialogue so people don't yeah. just because sometimes we can we can pull back or we can stop talking or we can disengage from the conversation when those kinds of things happen and as a leader we can't afford to have followers see that in us in a leadership environment and so having that having that strategic thought of saying okay even though this isn't going the way i want it to i can strategically work through this and and still keep you know, still stay engaged, still stay in the conversation, still work with people. Um, Tess, you said something really beautiful. I think earlier you were talking about having individualization as well, which allows you, I think, did, did, did you say that? Was that, I didn't dream that, right? So uh, good. I just think, okay, was that this, was that this webcast? Um, so having that individualization to be able to handle those followers uh, in, in a way that is best and maximized for them and how beautiful it is to have those two together, have strategic and individualization together to be able to have thought through all those necessarily, all those necessary items for each one of those. And how does it put my followers in the best possible situation for them? Janet asked that question about how to, how do you maximize your strategic? And I think that's part of the, the equation is thinking about, especially in leadership, you probably, when, when teammates has to make a decision or is moving in a direction and you know this is going to affect wh- whether it's your local team or whether it's those teams that you work with on the fringe, I imagine your brain begins to churn. Like, okay, what are all the things that have to happen now to make sure these people come along? Is that a process that you feel when it happens? Definitely. And I think a big thing about that and what I've learned um, – about that blend, especially strategic individualization, is when when something like that happens, knowing how and in what way to best get people on board. So each and every person is unique and different, and they are going to respond to different tactics. Um, and and I don't want mean this to sound like. I'm manipulating people to make sure they get on board, which I think can be a label sometimes of strategic, but knowing that um, this person is going to respond if I tell them a story of of a mentee and, and I'm able to pull at the heartstrings because they have high empathy or they have high harmony and they want to know the face and the name and the background of who we're impacting. And this person is going to respond with cut and dry data, cut and dry numbers, um, knowing how to communicate what to pull, what blend of that to pull, um, but also the method at which to communicate it. And that's something I've learned. And especially as a millennial, I've had to like kind of um, be, be okay with because I want to contact everyone via email all the time. And I only want people to contact me via email, but knowing that people respond better if I give them a phone call um, or even shoot them a text or um, just being able to, um, with that individualization, I think as a leader, a leader is about yielding yourself to your your followers, um, being willing to put their needs um, before mine. And so even if I want to only be communicated via email and only want um, to communicate out via email, knowing that I have followers that need me to call and ask how they're doing before I break the news of change to them. Um, something like that. Yeah. We, I, I do want to say you used the M word here a second ago in, in manipulating people. And I think mm-hmm. I thought you were going to say millennial. Oh. <laughs> well, Sorry, that one too. M word. <laughs> that, that, and this has come up several times in our conversations throughout the year on leadership of these, sometimes these themes can look manipulative in some ways. And I, and I want to say there's a fine line. You just danced it a little bit. There's a fine line between manipulating people and moving people. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I think sometimes in leadership, we have to be careful that we are, we do have to move people. And that means sometimes we've got to coax them. You just said you gave two really great examples there of how you individualized someone, saw what they needed to hear, right? This, this, this compassion or stability or whatever, whatever played to get, to get them to move. And, and I, I don't think we should be as leaders, we shouldn't be ashamed of that. That shouldn't be something we avoid. The word manipulation has some negative connotation, especially in English. I, but I would rather say them to move them. And so kudos to you, Tess. You're getting a lot of kudos in the chat room as well from folks who are really enjoying this dialogue. But we need, as leaders, we still have to move people. That's part of what we do. And, and I love just to hear you're like using your strategic, your thought process to get people based on what they need to bring them into the equation. Do you think with your strategic, do you have a very, um, do you have a well thought out thought process? In other words, when a problem is presented, do you work through a series of steps that you know, or does it just kind of happen for you? It just happens. And I think that's the hard part with strategic is I, it's hard to, to walk through. I'm sure internally or implicitly I'm going through a pretty logical process. And, and I, um, Mike had mentioned that, um, with strategic, you kind of think like backwards or kind of in clouds. And, and I don't know if it's my blend of other strengths, but I think pretty linearly. Um, I think pretty systematically and logically, and it's probably the blends of my um, other themes with it that kind of forces strategic into that pattern. And so I'm always thinking about what's the next step and the next step and the next step. And sometimes it'll then draw me back to the original step to take a different one. So, um, but it's, it's hard to describe. There's not one set thought process. I don't go from point A to point B in terms of when a problem's presented, but because it's so natural and innate. And I think there's something about strategic that is rapid. There's a quick pace to it. And so it's hard to even, I'm sure, all of those logical steps of processing a problem happen, but they also happen in a minute or two when I have to make a decision. Uh, So it's hard to then slow that down and freeze frame it in order to walk people through that process. And that's, I think, when people get into tough situations with strategic is not just simply not being able to describe it well. And I think that the M word, I love moving people instead of um, that we're manipulating people. And I think just the difference between those two is intent, if it's malintent or good intent. And so um, knowing and assuming the best that people have the best intent um, that we're choosing to move people, because you're right, if we're not going anywhere, we're going to start falling backwards um, if you're not moving forward. And so um, being able to say to followers, um, catering your approach, but moving them forward in a good direction. And I think strategic does that because it is kind of an anticipatory strength like we talked about. I wonder if for strategic, uh, it's hard to describe the thought process because the thought process is not a single moment. If you think back mm-hmm. to what Tess talked about with knowing if I call this person and I talk about a specific person and I put a face in a name, that will tug at their empathy. Or if I send this person a text or if I Snapchat them, that is how that they will, that's how they will uh, respond. Those insights didn't just come from her gut. They probably came from things that she's constantly thinking about. And the very fact that she's thinking about the best way to create a plan to approach them that's strategic. That's, um, it, that's, it's not just, I made a list of the thing, the people I need to approach. And so I'm going to follow it. It's not, I, I care about these people. So I'm going to approach them. It's I'm thinking, and I am enraptured by the idea of thinking and planning the how that's going to get us to where we need to be. Yeah. There's also some, some feedback in the chat room. Megan is kind of calling on some of your adaptability tests as we think about, mm-hmm. you know, your, that process, you, you saying, hey, I don't necessarily have a button down process may speak to that very close adaptability, you know, the strategic adaptability combo yes. <laughs> sometimes gets called on the carpet. Like how, mm-hmm. how can, you know, and one can feed another, which I think is really, really awesome. In, in your case, um, you're able to kind of things happen. You've got a whole bunch of plans. You can kind of, uh, you can kind of shape and mold them. And then still with the individualization, working with people then be able to quickly on the fly individualize. So is, I, does that sound accurate? I mean, are we that are, is so accurate? So I have a, an example, a great example of all of those, I think, into play. Um, recently, um, my colleague and I, who's another um, strengths advocate within our organization, we were out in um, 
we were, we were out in a strengths community, um, Holdridge, and a few weeks ago, a Holdridge, Nebraska, and we were doing a strengths activity and we work, we were working with a group of sixth graders and, um, and we were kind of running short on time. We usually have a good amount of time with, um, the youth that we work with, with our mentees. And, um, oftentimes after they take, um, strengths, uh, explorer or strengths quest, we ask them to talk about or depict and oftentimes color with cardstock, um, what their strengths smell like or taste like or feel like. And they're, you know, youth are so good at describing it. They just get it. And um, we were running really short on time. We had about 10 minutes left. And um, Al, my co colleague, Allie, she looked at me and she was like, what do we do? And so I'm like, innately and now I'm just processing this out with you guys I'm running through all the possibilities I'm like okay well we can we have another session right after this we could just cut it short and you know wish them goodbye we didn't have any cardstock or markers with us so we really couldn't do that activity um, but I noticed the um, the coordinator there she had play-doh and so um, in my head um, Allie just kind of let it over, you know, let me kind of run with it. So I gave them, had them each pick out a color of Play-Doh and ask them to mold their strengths, to craft their strengths with Play-Doh. Um, and then I gave them two minutes. I made it a race because we were short on time and kids <laughs> love when there's a race and there's high energy. And um, so I made it a race. I gave them a countdown. And then when we were done, I had everybody get up and walk around and look at everybody else's um, sculptures and then asked for a few volunteers to describe their, um, their strengths. We've never done that before. Um, it was just kind of my, my adaptability that was like, we have 10 minutes left. And then my strategic that was looking at what could we do with the resources or what should we do? Um, and that individualization that was like, I still want them to be able to describe what's uniquely awesome about them. Um, so really, yeah, kind of all those, my context that knew we'd done something like this before, but I could, shifted a little bit. So all of those things. Um, I have a hard time describing individual strengths in action because I think they're always blending together. All of the work from our friend Kurt, we know and we see that they're all working together all the time. So those questions are awesome. I love talking about them all at play. And just one example I thought of, of pretty much all my strengths kind of in action there. <laughs> I love knowing that Allie could turn to you and say, what do we do? Uh, that's mm -hmm. a great example of sort of honoring the strengths of somebody else. Now, it might have been your adaptability. It might have been your strategic. More likely, it was she knows that you're constantly picking things up and sorting through to mm -hmm. alternatives and that you're better when it's a surprise, <laughs> when, yep. it's a, when it's a situation yep. that needs immediate uh, mm -hmm. response. And so it's it's not an either or. I really don't care which one of those it was for you. It's yeah. both both and. Yeah. Definitely. And what a beautiful way to, to know that and to get the best out of the situation for Allie, mm -hmm. just to say, all right, Tess, you're on. <laughs> yep. And that comes with trust. It's come, it's come with time. And just like going back to one of the very first questions that we talked about, I, I have a proven track record with her. We, we work a lot. We travel a lot together. We do our own video series, um, as we talked about on one of the call to coaches. Um, so she knows that she can lean on me in those situations where she might feel maybe a little frazzled or a little, you know, unsure of what to do because I can pick it up and run with it. And it was one of the best experiences we had um, working with youth. They were able to describe their strengths so, so well. And we got such unique sculptures um, that we probably wouldn't have seen if they had just drawn on cardstock. So. Played we, to the rescue. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have spent a lot of time, you know, Tess, with your, with the, your unique set of themes, as we've thought about strategic here, it moves very quickly for you in a lot of ways because you have mm -hmm. some pathways that let it go that way. There's some chat in the chat room uh, going on. right. I'm sorry to replicate that, but there's some chat going on right now around what if we have strategic and then we, we pair that with a deliberative or an analytical, right? That could slow things down a little bit. That could, it, from a speed standpoint. So, I guess, uh, you know, as we, as you listen to these theme Thursdays and we think about these, Micah, we get some pushback sometimes in our chat room or, or in our Facebook groups about that. It's really, really important that you spend some time thinking about you, right? And this, mm -hmm. and that t these are Tess's, these are Tess's themes, right? That, but they belong uniquely to her. And, uh, and with you, it could and should and may, uh, and will look a little bit different. And so the, the beauty of this, and Tess, you alluded to this just a second ago, she gave the students an opportunity to express who they were based on these things they did. You didn't try to superimpose your own theme bias on top of them, right? We give this people an opportunity. I think that's what's beautiful about this movement is we can all come to this. We own these, not someone else. They're about us mm -hmm. uh, and that you own yours, but there are others. The question is, and I love what Allie leans on you for productivity. She knows in a moment when she's in a crisis and she needs something that will be productive, that's what you needed with these kids. 
she called on you for that and you produced a very beautiful, very well done, very quickly drawn out exercise, which helped those kids see these individual things about themselves. So at the end of the day, it always still comes back to productivity. How are we better than to tomorrow than we were today? Right? How do we, how can we be more productive by knowing ourselves? So anyways, Micah, we are getting close to the end here. Any final yeah. thoughts? Um, just what you said, Jim, there's, um, there is some quickness to strategic, the quickness, regardless of whatever comes around it is the sorting between alternatives. Now, when you're culling and you're absorbing information, that's going to depend on the speed of that's going to depend on those other themes. So such a great reminder that well, you get to hear from one person, you get to hear from Tess, um, but you need to figure out uh, what, what that means for you as well. And more importantly, how can that help somebody's tomorrow be better than today? Uh, but there certainly is a quickness to strategic that is um, the ability to compare and contrast. Now, how you get all that into your head might be slow, might be fast, might be totally different. Um, but I, I just love getting to hear this from Tess today and think about it, not just in the context of all of her other themes, but really how is she using this and how is she using this to gain trust? I think that's been a, a fantastic theme with you today, Tess. So thanks for helping us think about uh, strategic as being not just a critical piece that makes you smart and thoughtful, but as something that makes you very, very valuable and, and trustworthy mm -hmm. to others and, and allows you to open up to trust people as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Tess, great to have you on. You guys have now completed, I'm going to call it the trifecta. Uh, we had Allie on called the coach by herself. We had you and Allie <laughs> together talking about, now we have just you on theme Thursday. So definitely our community has gotten a good dose of, of teammates and uh, certainly a great organization and you guys do great things there. And we want to highlight that you're close by, which is here in our Omaha office is helpful, but um, thanks again for the work that you do. Thanks for being willing to come into the office today to uh, to do this interview with us. And just thanks for all the great work that you're doing. I know teammates can be a great example of what can be done in communities. And uh, there's ways to, um, you know, there's ways to interact. If you are thinking of this mentoring program or you want to do it in your own community, Tess, what's the best way for folks if they had questions about teammates, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Sure. Um, well, there's a ton of information on our website. It's teammates.org, www.teammates.org. Um, you can also reach out to me directly and I can filter your questions to whoever might be able to answer them. Um, and my email is tstarman, S-T-A-R-M-A-N, at teammates.org. T Starman, that sounds cool. Yes. And you will filter those strategically, by the way. We'll just I remind will. You. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. We'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we have available at the Galp Strength Center. It's galpstrengthcenter.com. Hey, don't turn it off yet. I got some things to say. I know you're tempted. <laughs> don't turn it off. Send us your questions or comments if you'd like to be a guest blogger. Uh, we do have some, uh, we do have a blog that you could write for to uh, four to 600 words. Send us that in an email. Send it to coaching at gallup.com. Put guest blogger in the subject line and that'll route its way over to Micah. And uh, we can consider that for our blog. By the way, 60, we hit 62,000 views to that blog in the month of October. We are super excited about Congratulations, Micah, by the way, on that. As the leader, always great. And so if you're considering doing that, we'd love to hear from you. Remember, all our social links, renewed, uh, a, a new designed resources page are available on our coach's blog, coaching.gallup.com. Cl click on the resources tab. We look forward uh, to doing this again. We've got one more left in season three series uh, coming up, restorative. Ironically, that was the one that didn't work for us, and we had to fix it. And Everything it was broken, <laughs> so we had to fix restorative. <laughs> we had to fix restorative. It's, it's here next week, and a season wrap coming December 7th. Watch our Facebook groups. We've got some special things coming for you. We're going to look for a little input back from you. You're also going to get to meet everyone behind the scenes in our wrap party on December 7th. It'll be kind of fun to have to have them on the program as well. Uh, with that, we'll ask you to share this and we'll say, we'll see you next on the next theme Thursday. And with that, we'll say goodbye everybody.